Hello and welcome everybody to uh, my talk, Analyzing and Breaking QNX Exploit Mitigations and PRNGs for Automotive, Industrial, Medical and Other Embedded Systems. My name is Jos Wetzels and uh, I'm an independent security researcher with Midnight Blue, where I mainly focus uh, on embedded system security. I previously worked as a researcher at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, focusing on uh, critical infrastructure protection mainly. And uh, most of this work was done as part of my uh, master's thesis at the Eindhoven University of Technology, also in the Netherlands. And this research was done uh, together with my colleague, Ali Abbasi. Uh, he's a PhD candidate at the Eindhoven University of Technology and a visiting researcher at the Ruhr University of Bochum in Germany, where he mainly focuses on industrial control system security and embedded binary security. So I want to start off with a little roadmap. Um, today I'm going to start with an introduction to QNX. Uh, what exactly is it? Then I'm going to move on to the operating system and security architecture outline before discussing the QNX PRNGs and the exploit mitigations and finishing off with some final remarks. So what exactly is QNX? Uh, QNX is a Unix-like, POSIX-compliant, real-time uh, embedded operating system. It uh, was initially released in 1982 and later acquired by BlackBerry, uh, which is also its current owner. Uh, it's closed source and proprietary. And there are two main lines of QNX, QNX 6.6 uh, these days, uh, released in March of uh, 2014, which is a 32-bit operating system, and QNX 7, which is a 64-bit operating system, which was released in March of 2017. Uh, it's most famously known for its use in uh, mobile devices, such as BlackBerry 10 and BlackBerry tablet operating systems, where it forms the core basis of the operating system. But really, this is only the tip of the iceberg of QNX usage, especially these days. It's far more well known for its use, for example, in uh, automotive systems. Uh, BlackBerry absolutely dominates the infotainment market. Uh, you find it in a lot of in-vehicle info infotainment systems, in telematics control units, and so on. As you can see, for example, most famously, uh, it was used in uh, the infotainment unit, which featured in the hack uh, by um, Charlie Miller and Chris Valisak. Another use of QNX and automotive is uh, as part of BlackBerry Radar, which is a fleet monitoring solution used for uh, trailers, flatbeds, fans, heavy equipment. And here it provides asset tracking and telematics functionality, uh, which allows for cargo integrity and anti-theft functionality, as well as preventative maintenance and operational efficiency. Uh, and the final use of QNX in uh, automotive systems or projected use is its use in autonomous vehicles. So BlackBerry Korea has created an innovation center for connected and autonomous vehicles and partner with various uh, big players, uh, NVIDIA, Delphi Automotive, uh, Baidu, uh, which all seek to integrate QNX as part of their self-driving car platforms. Uh, in the industrial sector, uh, you encounter it in the more high-end systems as well. Uh, for example, in the uh, nuclear HMI systems by Westinghouse, uh, a flat panel display system which forms an interface between the safety system processor and, um, and uh, human machine interface uh, displays. This runs on QNX, a much older version than I'm going to discuss today, QNX uh, 4. But um, yeah, you can see that this is uh, quite an important sector to, uh, to take a look at as well. Uh, it's used in defense applications a lot too. Uh, one example, but just one out of many, is the fact that it's used in the uh, Harris Falcon 3 line of tactical radios, where QNX uh, forms the basis of the operating system there. And you can find it in the uh, medical sector as well, surgical robots, uh, such as the one by DLR, where it's uh, used in microsurgery uh, applications. Another very interesting use case uh, is uh, in carrier routers uh, because QNX, as you can see on the right of the slide, forms the basis of Cisco's iOS XR uh, operating system which runs on the CRS 12000 and uh, ASR 9000 <coughs> series. And there are, of course, many, many more critical systems where you can find QNX from industrial control sectors such as surface mining control, turbine controllers, to defense and aerospace such as anti-tank guidance or UAVs real safety equipment and uh, cancer therapy machines. So this should be sufficient reason to be interested in uh, the security of QNX. Now, what's new? Some of you uh, might have seen uh, my talk at, uh, not last year's, but the year before that, Wheel of Fortune at the CCC, which discussed PRNG issues in various embedded operating systems, including QNX. Now, in this talk, I will discuss uh, new QNX 7 user space and kernel space PRNGs, which were introduced as part of that assessment. Uh, or as a result of that assessment, I should say, and the exploit mitigations in QNX 6 and 7, which have not been discussed before yet. So let's start off with the operating system and security architecture of QNX. 
Uh, QNIX is a true microkernel architecture, which means that only the most basic operating system functionality, such as the scheduler, message passing, and interrupt handling, is located in the kernel, as you can see on the on the left, while all other functionality is included in user space. So these things run as separate processes outside of the kernel, and that includes traditional uh, functionality, which would be located in the kernel in a monolithic operating system, such as file system functionality, various kinds of drivers, protocol stacks. Uh, you name it. And the result of this is that um, it's a much more robust operating system because uh, if one of these operating uh, component system components fails then it doesn't bring down the entire kernel with it so that allows for uh, great use in, uh, in safety and survivability applications. Uh, in order for these components of the operating system to communicate with each other, QNX works by IPC message passing. And this is basically a client server architecture where you have a client application, such as some uh, process running in user space, communicating with uh, another functionality of the operating system or a protocol stack or a driver residing in user space and communicating through the microkernel by passing messages uh, which are specific to this particular functionality. So the attack surface roughly looks as follows, as you can see uh, here uh, on the slide. Now, on the right side, you have the remote attack surface for QNX, which uh, consists of the network managers, various kinds of packet drivers, uh, the protocol modules, um, different things like the communications device drivers, and various network services, which are used to in uh, most Unix environments. And on the left, you have the local attack surface, which consists of the process manager, the path manager, uh, memory manager, resource managers for various custom I.O. handlers, uh, the PPS architecture, and various kinds of device drivers which might be written by third party uh, applications, uh, file system graphics and uh, audio stuff. And of course there's the microkernel itself, but because there is so little functionality in there, the attack surface there is very limited as well. Um, on the plus side, for attackers at least, is the fact that you don't actually need to attack the microkernel to get uh, root access. Uh, attacking one of the processes that run as root uh, locally can be sufficient for elevating privileges as well. So a little bit about the BlackBerry, uh, um, by the QNX uh, security history. So there hasn't been a ton of research out there. Uh, most of the research that has been out there has been a, a byproduct of the BlackBerry mobile research, mainly in the period from 2011 to 2014. Um, this was followed by some uh, research on QNX, IPC, PPS, and kernel call security by Alex Plaskett et al. in 2016. Uh, various individual vulnerabilities were discovered over the years. As you can see on the pie chart on the right, this was mainly set UID logic bugs and various kinds of memory corruption issues, buffer overflows, and so on. Um, what's interesting to see is that you can find a lot of set UID logic bugs that you would expect to encounter in a very old Unix like system. You know, uh, if you go back to the early 2000s, uh, there are a lot of memory corruption issues in various standard utilities still, even in the uh, graphical user interface that were discovered, uh, and lots of insecure permission settings. So, this was the attack surface uh, and the security history when I started looking uh, at QNX. Uh, another interesting thing to notice is that uh, QNX uh, had received some interest uh, from the CIA, which was revealed in uh, the WikiLeaks Vault 7 releases, where they listed it as one of the targets for the uh, embedded uh, development branch because of its use in, in automotive systems. Now, they hadn't done any work as of 2014, according to the leaks. Of course, we don't know if anything has advanced past that. So to summarize, there has been no prior work on exploit mitigations or PRNGs for QNX up until this point, and there has been almost no prior work on any of the internals so far, but that's changing. So to start off, QNX uh, supports a minimal set of native system calls because it's a true microkernel, and these system calls mainly relate to threading, message passing, signals, clocks, interrupt handlers, and all this very basic functionality. And for comparison, QNX has less than 90 system calls compared to Linux, which is over 300. So you can see how lightweight and how small the attack surface for the microkernel is here. And the prototypes for these things are defined in the neutrino.h header file, 
Um, of course, because it's a POSIX compliant operating system, it does implement all the system call functionality that comes with it. Uh, the way it does this is by implementing these functions in libc as message passing stops which basically wrap around calls to other user space processes which actually implement it instead of native system calls. Uh, the way this works is native system calls are invoked with the usual instructions, uh, sys enter, interrupt 0x28, SWI or SVC on ARM, SC on uh, PowerPC. Uh, the system call number uh, is located in AX on x86, on register 12 on ARM, and on register 0 on uh, PPC. And the listings for, uh, for these system call invocation uh, stops are in uh, kernel calls.h. And uh, the system call entry point in the, um, in the uh, microkernel is located at the cur entry or cur sys enter symbol. And here the registers are saved, uh, switch is made to the kernel stack, uh, the active kernel thread is retrieved, and then we wait until we are on the right CPU and we acquire a kernel and actually dispatch the kernel call, which is done by a simple call to the uh, system call index in the kernel call table. So the QNX boot process. The QNX boot process works by after power on having hardware uh, being initialized, then having the um, initial program loader, the IPL, copy the image file system, the IFS to RAM, uh, then you get a startup program, uh, which depends on the kind of architecture you're on, for example a startup program for the BIOS, if there is one present, which configures the system, interrupt controllers and so on, which then passes control to the actual microkernel called PROC NTO on, uh, on QNX, which sets up the kernel and then runs a boot file, a build file, such as a boot script, uh, which initializes the drivers in user space and other operating system components, and then the full system is initialized. Uh, QNX firmware is relatively straightforward. There are very, uh, various QNX operating system packages, uh, QNX car, QNX safety, QNX medical, but under the hood these are all roughly the same. It's all the same neutrino microkernel and the core services binaries uh, are the same as well. The, the only differences here are really uh, in usual land um, binaries that you find packaged with the, uh, the core and the microkernel uh, binaries. Uh, the QNX images come in three flavors. Uh, an operating system image which is called the IFS and pictured on the right of the slide uh, what it looks like, a uh, flash uh, file system image called the EFS and then we have an embedded transaction file system uh, image called the ETFS and these can be combined into a single image stored on an NAND flash chip as you can see on the right of the, of the slide. So this is how you might encounter this in some embedded systems. Now unpacking it is very easy because QNX has provided us with the dump IFS and dump EFS utilities so if you encounter a firmware image and you chop it into the EFS and the EFS uh, file, uh, file segments then you can quickly unpack it with the standard utilities that have been provided by QNX. And the QNX memory layout is divided into a kernel space part and a user space part uh, which are uh, separated so that only the microkernel truly runs into kernel space. User space has separation of sensitive code from regular applications uh, by means of virtual private memory, uh, at least if a memory management unit uh, is present on, uh, on part of the hardware. And this allows you to uh, enforce Unix like process access controls, as you can see on the bottom of the slide. Uh, QNX user management is really what you're used to in most Unix like environments. Uh, you have your user and file permission model, which is all uh, mostly the same, the et cetera, pass with the uh, group and shadow files. Uh, you have the usual login utilities. You have some support for mandatory access control listings. Uh, what's interesting is that QNX 6 hashes uh, use SHA 256 or 512 by default, but there is big backwards compatibility support for MD5, DES script, and a legacy QNX script uh, hashing scheme, which is not really a hashing scheme because it's fully invertible, as you can see on the right of the slide at news posting from 2000. Um, what's interesting is that this backwards compatibility is enabled in some systems for uh, backwards compatibility support with older uh, build images. So you might still encounter QNX6 uh, images where you have DES script or MD5. Um, that's interesting for embedded systems because a cracked root or maintenance password in embedded systems can have a very high shelf life because of course updates are not as uh, frequent there as you might expect in the general purpose world. <coughs> 
As of QNX7 or patched versions of QNX6.6, the default hashing scheme is PBKDF2 uh, with SHA256 or SHA512. So that's an improvement. Uh, QNX process management is done by the process manager, which is combined with the microkernel in one executable. Uh, this runs as a root process with PID1 uh, and invokes a microkernel in the same way as every other process, despite the fact that it's packaged with, uh, within the same executable. But it has a special flag which allows it to call uh, a specific system call called ring zero, which allows you to execute arbitrary code within ring zero if you are in possession of this, uh, this process flag. Uh, there's support for usual POSIX stuff, spawn, fork, exec, all that kind of stuff. And QNIX uses the ELF format for its binaries. Um, what's interesting to notice is uh, that if the file system is on a block oriented device, uh, code and data are loaded into main memory. But if the file system is on a memory map device, uh, for example on flash, uh, it can be executed in place, which means that multiple instances of the same process will share uh, code memory. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, QNX has support for process abilities uh, in the form of uh, proc manager ability, which is very similar to the Linux capabilities model. Uh, you can obtain capabilities before dropping root privileges if you want to be able to do some things but not allow uh, all of the things to a particular process. Uh, you can restrict actions for even root processes in this way. And this is integral to QNX's uh, rootless execution security model uh, by ensuring some degree of the principle of least privilege. Uh, abilities have a domain for root users or non root users. Uh, they have a range, uh, restricting it to certain values, inheritability, lockability, etc. So you can, for example, if you want to be able to use the spawn set UID system call, you can restrict the range for the set UIDs that are allowed to be spawned by a certain process. And you can specify custom abilities as well if you're a system integrator. Now, there are some limitations to this model which are not actually included in the documentation or discussed out there if people want to uh, adopt a rootless execution model. So it's up to the developers and the system integrators to really get this right. Uh, you need to watch out with inheritability because inheritability is inheritable itself. And that means that if you want an ability to be inheritable by a child process but not by the child processes of that child process, then you need to explicitly state this. Uh, some system calls honor this uh, inheritability, others do not, and uh, this is not well, well documented which do and uh, which do not. Some functionality remains uncovered by capabilities, file system functionality for example, networking functionality. So don't treat this like an actual sandbox, which some people do, but it's not. Some capabilities don't have ranges, for example, uh, if you want to be able to spawn processes, you cannot specify which process you are allowed to spawn and which you are not. Uh, various capabilities can be used to elevate privileges to root, even if you're not. Uh, and some of these are very clear, for example, the spawn set UID system call, but in some other cases it's not that clear, for example, the aid interrupt call. It's not a true sandbox and you can see here why, for example. Let's say you have a low privilege child process and you have IO and interrupt privileges, then you can use this to attach a custom interrupt service routine handler uh, which runs in kernel space and allows you to invoke arbitrary microkernel code. Obviously for security people it's, it's very, you know, obvious to say, well, if I can run an interrupt service routine, then I can execute within microkernel and then it's game over. But for system integrators who don't come from a security background, this is not that clear, especially if all these different uh, calls and the implications are not well documented. Another interesting uh, part of the attack surface is QNET, which is a native networking uh, protocol which is laid on top of anything with a packet driver. So I previously discussed the IPC security model and this can be extended using QNET. So instead of having the communication between components and one microkernel, you can extend this over any kind of interconnect. So Ethernet or some kind of serial link or whatever and then you can lay QNET on top of that and communicate between different components and different uh, microkernels. So you can have a distributed computing application. What's interesting is that this is very useful for applications such as intermodule communication in uh, industrial control systems. Let's say you have a factory floor and you have one application which is distributed among different machines and you want these to be able to communicate with the same microkernel then you can use this application. It's useful in automotive for example if you want to share a cellular modem or a Bluetooth transceiver among many ECUs in, uh, in some automotive application. 
and it's used in large routers uh, with multiple interface cards. For example, the LWM IPC and Cisco's iOS XR uh, operating system. Um, the way it works, QNAT, is that once you plug in this, uh, this driver, the net directory is populated by uh, discovered or mapped QNAT nodes, as you can see on the slide here. And it's really meant to be used among trusted nodes. This is what they say. So they say, you know, don't expect much security wise. It's meant to be used only among trusted nodes. But while this might have been true in the past, many of these nodes can no longer be uh, considered trusted in many embedded environments. For example, uh, an automotive system which might have been closed now might have an infotainment or a telematics unit with an internet facing uh, or network facing attack surface. So you can no longer consider all of the nodes uh, on that particular network trusted. Uh, QNET does not have any kind of authentication. Uh, it simply passes a user ID as part of the QNET packet to a remote machine and then it trusts that you're not lying. Um, this is interesting because you can execute commands remotely over QNET, as you can see on the slide here, uh, on a local machine, and there I'm executing it on a remote node and executing this command without any kind of authentication. This means that if I compromise a single QNX machine on uh, a network with multiple QNX machines or the underlying network link, then I have access to all the QNET nodes at the particular UID level I already possess on my own machine. Um, there's no QNET packet integrity or authentication, so I can forge these. Uh, even if I'm not ro root on my local machine, then I can still forge a root ID. Now, there is some kind of protection here in the form of the map any and map root options, which are uh, simple, similar to the BSD NFS uh, options. And this allows you to map any incoming UID to a low privileged uh, UID. So that means that on a particular machine, if I receive an incoming packet, I can say regardless of whether it's root or whatever, I map it to nobody and at least limit some of the harm. The problem is that this was not implemented fully correctly. I discovered a, a elevation of privilege vulnerability here. Read permissions of any operations executed over QNET are not properly resolved by the resource manager. And this allows for arbitrary remote read access over QNET, regardless of privileges. And this can also be used, of course, for local arbitrary read access by making a read re request uh, originate from a remote node. So instead of reading locally, I dispatch it through QNET over a remote node to actually disclose the local shadow file regardless of my low privileges as you can see there. Uh, this bypasses these map emni and map root settings. Uh, patch is available but QNET security is really fundamentally broken. If you encounter QNET in an embedded ses setting, um, you're usually golden. Uh, QNX has uh, great debugging capabilities. Uh, so there is a QNX Momentix IDE which uh, integrates GDB uh, debugger capabilities um, by means of the pdebug utility. Uh, this allows for process level debugging over serial or TCP IP. Um, this is wrapped by the QCon utility which uh, is used for remote IDE connectivity. This starts the pdebug utility on port 8000. A great thing to notice is again here is no authentication so if system integrators uh, failed to remove this debugging utility, then you can upload or download files and run anything as root uh, by default on this system and there's already a Metasploit module for this, so keep an eye out for that. Um, debugging is also facilitated by the dumper utility, which is a service that produces post-crash core dumps uh, by default in the var dumps directory. Um, you can also directly uh, dump a running process using this utility and this is very nice for integration into fuzzers if you want to collect all these post-mortem uh, crashes. And there is also kernel debugging capability over serial using kdebug. Uh, this needs to be included with the IFS because it's not by default. Uh, you may need to build this uh, from source depending on uh, the architecture you're using and you need a debuggable version of proc NTO for this. It's, it's really a pain in the ass to get it working but it, it can be done if you have the time to spare. Um, finally, uh, kernel dumps come in a particular format as you can see here. Um, you have your uh, signal, code and fault uh, options which indicate, uh, which can be looked up in uh, the uh, corresponding header files. Uh, you have the kernel code and data location where the crash occurred. You have the kernel state at the time of the crash. You have the kernel stack base, process and thread IDs on the CPUs uh, that are currently active, process and thread flags, basically anything you want to get a good look at what caused a particular kernel crash. So that brings us to the pseudo random number generators. 
So why take a look at the PRNGs? Well, first of all, because the PRNGs form the foundation of the wider cryptographic ecosystem. Uh, the received wisdom for many developers and system integrators is if you need secure randomness, just use dev random. And in, in my opinion, uh, secure randomness provision is a core task of any modern operating system. So you should be able to expect some kind of secure pseudo random number generator to be provided by the operating system. Secondly, because the strength of some exploit mitigations should depend in part on the strength of the PRNGs. For example, if I can predict the stack canary or the ASLR addresses, it makes exploit development a lot easier. So you want strong PRNGs to be present on your system. Now, Qnix has two uh, security oriented PRNGs. The first is the user space PRNG, which is accessed through the dev random interface, and this is handled by the user space service random which is run as root. This is started after boot by the startup script, as you can see here. It's run, um, run as a, a user space service. And then you have a second kernel space PRNG uh, introduced in QNX7, which is implemented in the microkernel as a function named random value. And this cannot be accessed directly in user space. It's only for kernel space. Now the QNX6 uh, dev random user space PRNG was covered in uh, our talk Wheel of Fortune at 33C3. So I'll give a brief recap here. Uh, the underlying PRNG is based on the Yarrow PRNG by Bruce Schneier et al. But it turned out to be based on an older version of Yarrow and not the reference Yarrow 160. So it was a version that was put out before Yarrow was actually fully, um, well not standardized, but fully finalized. And on top of that, they integrated a bunch of sketchy cryptographic design decisions. I'll, I'll save you the details. But just to give you uh, uh, an overview, uh, the boot time entropy gathering uh, happens on the top right. You have the clock time, the clock cycles, the process PIDs, and device names, which are all concatenated and pulled through SHA-1, and that creates the initial state. Well, of course, that, that ensures terrible boot time entropy quality because, you know, the process IDs and the device names are not going to vary on an embedded system on every startup, and the clock cycles and clock time just provide too little entropy to make for a good initial state. Uh, on top of that, they had broken receipt control, which meant that the, the runtime entropy collection, which happens on the bottom of the slide, was implemented and it was running, but they never actually mixed any of the entropy gathered at runtime back into the pool again. So the only entropy that was in the system was the one that was present at boot time. So, yeah, that was quite terrible. Then the runtime entropy selection was also left up to system integrators. So they had to decide, for example, uh, from what interrupt sources to gather uh, their entropy. And this is kind of a hard decision if you're not a security engineer. So there was a lot of rope for people to hang themselves with. Now, after our assessment of QNX 6, uh, we um, contacted BlackBerry and um, gave them some, uh, some, some design advice, and they incorporated this into the new QNX, dev random, uh, QNX 7 dev random user space PRNG. And they now use the Heimdall Fortuna implementation, uh, they have some new entropy sources, they have a new reset control mechanism, the overall quality seems much better than QNX 6, and the potential for weaknesses still remains, depending on system integration conditions, but is a little bit less. So what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. So the sources in green are the new sources on QNX7. So now you have a seed file source, which basically means that once the system starts up, you can specify a particular file with some entropy, and this will be used as boot time entropy to be mixed into the entropy pool. And when the system shuts down, it can write this to a file again, and so you have new entropy for the next boot. And this is to really address low boot time entropy conditions, which are really common in embedded systems because at boot time there's not a lot of activity going on. Um, the second new source is the user supplied entropy. So users can write their own entropy gathering daemon, which can be whatever people want depending on the embedded device uh, they're using, even a true random number generator. And then they can simply write to the dev random interface and uh, add entropy to the pool. It's interesting to notice that this interface is left ri world writable by default, which can be a problem depending on how many other entropy sources have been selected. So you might want to watch out for that if you, um, if you encounter a QNX system. Um, finally, they have a new reseed source, which works by using RC4 random, which basically is seeded with output of the PRNG itself, which is not bad. 
Uh, but in, in addition, it uses the process ID again, the time of day, and the user ID, which are static. So that doesn't add a whole lot. Um, it's better, but it's, it's, it's still not, not perfect, to be honest. Um, in addition to the QNX7 user space PRNG, they now also introduced a kernel PRNG for randomness that is needed within the microkernel itself because, you know, the user space PRNG starts up after boot and you might need early boot randomness. Uh, the QNX7 uh, kernel PRNG um, is used for ASLR, stack canaries, and that kind of functionality. And it works basically as follows. So you have a couple of sources, clock cycles, uh, the currently active uh, process ID, uh, the, currently, the current time in nanoseconds, um, the wake up timer, which is basically a timer that is set for the kernel to trigger some activity, and various kinds of these sources are all concatenated into one PRNG input block that's pulled through SHA-256. And that results in a PRNG state. This PRNG state is chopped into 32-bit blocks. The first block is kept secret and is stored uh, as a salt. And the next block, that's output as a 32-bit random value. And then when the next call is made, the, the salt is included as part of the new input. And um, these bl the, the next block is taken, the next block, and the next block, and the next block until the PRNG state is exhausted. And then the whole thing starts again. In addition to these sources, uh, there is now also uh, a sysrandom system call. And this new system call, which requires a certain uh, QNX capability, allows um, uh, users to supply some randomness for the kernel PRNG as well. And this is uh, a big improvement over QNX7, which did not have any kind of secure randomness in, uh, in the kernel. And this brings us to the exploit mitigations. So why look at exploit mitigations? Well, the mitigations in the general purpose world didn't come falling from the sky. Um, there is a history of weaknesses and bypasses in the general purpose world which have led to the current state of hardening that we've come to expect there. Uh, for example, if you look at Windows, it took years and years to get to the point where we are now. And the same holds for, for Linux uh, and smartphone operating systems, iOS. And we don't have a history like this in most embedded systems. Uh, QNX doesn't have a history like this. So that's a reason to start taking an offensive look at the implementations of their mitigations. And I have to say that QNX is already doing quite well comparative to many other embedded operating systems because they even bother to implement any mitigations in the first place. So QNX exploit mitigations, uh, for what does it have support? Uh, it has support for data execution prevention, it has support for address space layout randomization, it has support for stack canaries, and it has support for relocation read only. But none of these are enabled by default. So, yeah, it might still be that even if you encounter the uh, latest version of, of QNX in a system, that none of these mitigations are actually enabled despite them being supported, and it might still be exploiting like it's the 90s. But at least they, they are supported in theory. So there, you shouldn't expect any kind of support for advanced mitigation, such as V-table protection, control flow integrity, kernel uh, date and code isolation. None of this is present, just the ones that are listed here. Uh, QNX DEP works uh, by being based on hardware-based DEP support, uh, the NX uh, bit on, uh, on x86, the XN bit on, uh, on ARM that kind of stuff. There is support for the uh, x86 architecture, for uh, the ARM uh, architecture, version 6 and, and over. Uh, there is no support for this feature on, uh, on MIPS. Uh, and for PowerPC, it, it varies, but you know, that's, that's uh, logical considering PowerPC. Um, there are, the problem with QNX DEP is the fact that it has insecure default settings. So by default, the stack is always left executable. Even if you're running on a system with NX support and even if this is enabled, the stack will still be left executable. And any GNU stack ELF program headers in the ELF binary are completely ignored by the program loader. So even if you set up your linker correct, even if you have you know, the correct architecture, all that kind of stuff, you will still have an executable stack. You can only uh, make the stack non-executable by specifying this particular startup flag 
in the microkernel startup options, which makes the stack non-executable. And the problem here is that this is a system-wide setting without opt-outs. So if you ever, for whatever reason, need legacy executables or uh, executables which, for example, have executable code on the stack for whatever reason, then it's not backwards compatibility for this stuff. So for this reason, they decided not to fix this particular situation, and the issue is still present on QNX 6 and 7. And it makes for an interesting thing if you see a QNX image, inspect whether that flag is within the microkernel startup options, because if it's not, you don't even have to bother with a lot of the other stuff. That brings us to the second mitigation, QNX ASLR. Uh, this is again enabled by starting the microkernel with a specific flag. Uh, child processes inherit their parents' ASLR settings, uh, and these can be enabled or disabled on a per process basis. So you have a good opt out scheme here, at least if people specify it right. Um, objects are randomized at the base address level, uh, which is not very fine grained, but it goes for most a ASLR implementations, and all memory objects are randomized except for uh, the kernel uh, code image, which, you know, is only terrible if you really value K ASLR a lot in embedded systems. You can see here all the things on the right of the slide that are randomized by QNX ASLR. Uh, PI position independent executables are disabled by default in the tool chain uh, and you can really see the result of this that no system binaries by default have any PI in uh, the images you, uh, you encounter. So people will need to explicitly build their uh, base system and any subsequent executables with non-default tool chain settings to uh, have PI enabled. So in order to figure out how QNX ASLR works under the hood, I reverse engineer the memory manager and uh, it's mapped out in, in short form here. And what it really comes down to is that basically all the memory functionality is under the hood implemented using MMAP. And randomization happens at two points, uh, which are colored in blue, stack randomize and map find VA, and both of them uh, rely on the same random number generator. So let's start with mapfindVA, which is a function that, among other things, randomizes virtual addresses, uh, which are returned by the MMAP call. And the randomization here happens, as you can see on the right of the slide, by subtracting or adding a random value from or to the found virtual address. So it takes the lower 32 bits of the random number generator result, bitwise left shift them by 12, extracts the lower uh, 24 bits, and then applies that to the end result. Um, the problem, already the first problem, is that it contributes at most 12 bits of entropy here because of the bit mask that's applied. But as we'll see, this is worse in practice. The second function is stack randomize. And while well, it does what it says on the tin, it randomizes the stack start address. So once you allocate a stack, either when the process is started itself or when a new thread is spawned with its own stack, this function gets uh, applied to any allocated new stack. And the randomization happens, as you can see on the right of the slide, again in the same fashion by subtracting a random value from the original stack pointer. You take the lower 32 bits of the random number generator result, bitwise left shift them by four, and at most the lower 11 bits are extracted. Um, again, because of this bit mask, it contributes at most seven bits of entropy, depending on the stack size, as you can see how the, uh, the bit mask is constructed there. And again, this is worse in practice. Um, this is mitigated a little bit by the fact that it's combined with the results of MapfindVA, because any stack is first allocated using MMAP, and then this function gets applied, but in practice that doesn't really matter. The real problem is that QNIC 6's ASLR has a weak random number generator. These upper bounds we gave of 12 bits and 7 bits are actually optimistic. So QNIC 6's ASLR uses a random number generator that's basically a single call to the clock cycle system call. Uh, clock cycles, as the name already says, uh, retrieves a 64-bit free-running cycle counter and the implementation of which is architecture specific. So in x86 it will be a simple call to RDTSC uh, which retrieves a timestamp counter. Uh, on ARM it's the result of some, some emulation of this functionality. On MIPS it will retrieve the counter register, on PPC the TBF and on Super H the TMU. So it's, it's all more or less similar to RDTSC. Now, this is not a strong uh, use of randomness. Uh, we evaluated the actual entropy of this, uh, this particular uh, use, and we measured processes across different boot sessions and various different kinds of processes and harvested their memory object addresses. 
Uh, then we evaluated them using the NIST SP890B entropy source testing tool to obtain min entropy estimates. And uh, just a brief reminder 256 bits of uniformly random data should correspond to 256 bits of min entropy. Now, the average min entropy of an ASLR protected address on QNX is 4.47 bits. And this is very weak if you compare it to, for example, on the right of the slide, mainline Linux ASLR or the PAX ASLR implementation we have uh, entropy between 27 bits or at least 5.7 uh, bits of entropy. And why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem, for example, remotely because of brute forcing uh, attacks. If you have a uh, um, memory layout inheritance, which you have on QNX, that means that if you fork a process, the child process will copy the memory layout of the parent. And this happens after ASLR is applied. So that means that a child will have the same ASLR randomization applied to it as the parent. Now if you have an attacker, uh, for example attacking a network application which upon every new connection forks a client, a, a child process to handle this client connection, then an attacker can brute force this address and try one candidate. The child uh, will, will, will die if it's not the correct address and then the next one will be spawned and the next one and the next one and the next one. And if you don't have enough entropy in, this, uh, in these addresses, your brute force might be successful within uh, a reasonable time frame. And is this uh, reasonable within practice? Well, yes. As you can see on the left of the slide, you have a demo vulnerable service protected by uh, QNX ASLR. And on the right of the slide, in 23 seconds, you can remotely exploit this and pop a root shell. So that, that's not a lot of good for uh, ASLR. Of course, uh, not only does it have a weak random number generator, there are a lot of attack factors outside of that as well, which includes a lot of local information leaks. And I'm going to discuss two of them, but there are many, many more uh, out there that I'm sure anyone who takes a glance at it will find. Um, for example, uh, in the process file system, there was a very interesting info leak. Uh, QNX, like many Unix like systems, has a virtual process file system, which for every entry in uh, the every running process has a corresponding entry in this directory with information about the process. And you can query this information using the devctl uh, API, which retrieves information such as the memory map, uh, current register values, and all that kind of juicy information. And as you can see, on the top of the slide, the permissions are set to world readable, which is very interesting because that allows you to, as you can see here, retrieve as a low privileged user the complete memory layout of high privileged processes, including a microkernel, which kind of defeats the purpose of any ASLR because the goal of ASLR is not so much randomization as it is the insurance of memory layout secrecy to prevent code reuse attacks. Mm, the interesting thing is that even if you can't compile your own utility to exploit this locally, you can use the PIDN utility which is provided by QNH itself to achieve a similar result. So that's very nice. Uh, second information leak uh, I discovered was uh, resided in LDDebug, which is an environment variable which allows you to specify some information for debugging. And the interesting thing is that it has a debug option called all which you can use to start an application with full debugging capabilities, but this does not do any kind of privilege checking. So if I, I have a set UID binary that's set UID root, I start it and I'm a low privilege user, it fully ignores the fact that I don't have privileges to do whatever I want and then you can see that all the mapped uh, loaded libraries such as libc and the, the program image base are disclosed to me regardless of any kind of ASLR uh, or privilege settings. Now in QNX 7 as a result of these reportings they made some changes. ASLR uh, is still disabled by default uh, and there's no KSLR. But they do use the kernel PRNG we previously discussed now so uh, it's, it's the entropy is uh, much better in theory. Unfortunately, despite using this new random number generator and having a 64 bit address space on QNX7, the low theoretical upper bounds remained because they forgot to remove these bit masks. So, still, the, they are bounded by 7 bits for the stack and 12 bits, excuse me, and 12 bits for everything else. And as you can see, 
Here the code is always loaded into the lower 32 bits of the address space. So this, this really reduces the usefulness of ASLR even on QNX7. I've been told by BlackBerry that they're working on changing this, but I haven't had any, uh, any update yet. So even new QNX7 has this problem. Um, they did fix the LD debug issue, but unfortunately they did not completely fix the PROC FS issue. What they did, as you can see on the slide, is restrict um, any kind of reading using the PIDN utility, which is included with QNX by default. So this does do privilege checking, but if you write your own uh, C application that discloses this information, you can still read from higher privilege processes. So this is an info leak that's, that's free and out there to use. That brings us to the, the stack canaries. Uh, QNX uses GCC's stack smashing protector uh, for this, so um, you're probably all familiar with that. Uh, on the comp compiler side, uh, it's what we're used to, and uh, it's mostly okay. On the operating system side, however, the implementations are custom. Uh, the user space master canary is generated at program startup when libc is loaded, but it doesn't use libssp's guard setup function, but a custom init cookie functions to actually initialize uh, the master canary. Again, the problem here is low entropy. So it draws entropy from three sources, only two of which are relevant if ASLR is enabled, and all of them are again based on clock cycles. Here you can see RDTSC, and it's sort with the, uh, the address of a local stack variable and the address of the function itself, which are only randomized if ASLR is enabled, and of course also rely on clock cycles again. We did an evaluation of the entropy here as well uh, across three configurations without ASLR, with ASLR, but without PI, and with ASLR and PI. And the average min entropy we found to be 7.79 bits, which is less than ideal because using a secure uh, random number generator, you should have had 24 bits of min entropy considering that they use one byte for a null byte uh, in terminator style canary uh, form. So, this is on user space, but in kernel space the problems with the canaries are even worse. Uh, because the microkernel is neither loaded nor linked against libc, the master canary generation cannot be done by init cookies. Unfortunately, QNX forgot to implement any kind of replacement master canary uh, generation routine. And as a result, kernel space canaries are used everywhere throughout the microkernel, but they're never actually generated. So they're always left to zero, which is a very predictable canary value and makes it more or less useless. Um, as of QNX7, they have some changes. They're now uh, enabled by default, the canaries. They generate 64-bit canaries. And as per our advice, uh, in user space, QNX now mixes in uh, an ELF auxiliary vector value with the init cookie stuff, which is basically drawn from the kernel space PRNG, transported to user space, and mixed in with the, uh, the previous stuff we saw. And for kernel space, they simply concatenate two 32-bit kernel PRNG uh, values during very early boot. So um, stack canaries are more or less fixed in QNX7 now. And that brings us to the final mitigation, relocation read only. Um, to explain what this lesser known mitigation is about, um, dynamically linked binaries use relocation to do runtime lookup of symbols that reside in shared libraries, as you can see on the right of the slide. And this relocation data is a very popular target for overriding to hijack control flow. Because if I hijack one of the got PLT entries, for example, then once this particular function gets called, I can hijack control flow. And it's interesting because this, uh, this particular area doesn't get uh, randomized in, 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 in many systems. Um, one of these uh, implementations of this mitigation is partial railroad, where we can reorder ELF sections so that internal data, like the global offset table and, and destructors and stuff like that, precedes any program data, like the data in the BSS uh, section. The relocation data is then made read-only by covering it with a GNU railroad segment after relocation. But the problem is, because of what they call lazy binding, um, the PLT got will still be writable. And why is that the case? Because most of these uh, symbols will be looked up only during runtime, which means that you cannot make them uh, readable right away because they need to be writable during dynamic lookup. And that may means that the most interesting uh, part of, the, um, of these, these sections will still be writable. And this is where full railroad comes in. Uh, this basically works by disabling re lazy binding and resolving all the symbols at uh, load time, which makes for slower load times, but you know that's, that's the, the price you have to pay. And then the PLT got is, only read, is also read only. Um, 
Unfortunately, on QNX they did implement this, but they implemented it in a fully broken way. Uh, on the left you can see the implementation on Debian, uh, where the GNU railroad segment covers all of the sections, including the global offset table. And on the right you can see the implementation on QNX 6.6. .6. And here you can see that they forgot to relocate the global offset table before the program data. So the program data is in between all these internal data sections and, um, and the uh, GOT, which means that mm, the GOT is not actually meet, made read only. And that means that even though you set up your linker correctly and you think you're protected by RELRO, the GOT is still writable. Mm. Here you can see how that works out in practice. On the left you have on Debian Linux, one application protected with RELRO and we cannot write to the, uh, the uh, particular enter entry in the GOT PLT. And on the right you have the same application with the same linker settings on QNX 6.6 .6, and we can actually bypass that despite the protection which should have been active. So we also found a local bypass which was very weird. Apparently LD Debug has an undocumented option called imposter which does nothing except for disabling RELRO without any kind of privilege checks. And this is nice if you want to exploit set UID binaries locally. Uh, both of these issues are fixed with patches for QNX 6.6 .6 and QNX 7 however. That brings us to the final remarks. So we disclosed all the issues we discussed to BlackBerry. Most of these issues are fixed in 7. Uh, patches for 6.6 .6 are available uh, for some of these issues. But it will take lots and lots of time before these patches will filter down to the OEMs and end users in embedded systems. Um, you, people will need to recompile the, the, uh, the operating system, ship new firmware images. These firmware images will have to be loaded on whatever system. So these issues I discussed might be out there in real world systems for years and years to come. And in conclusion, most of the mitigations were okay on the toolchain side. Uh, some weak defaults and linker mistakes, but that wasn't the problem. But the problems really reside on the operating system side because QNX cannot benefit directly from any work that has been done in general purpose operating system security because they cannot easily port one to one because of a different architectural legacy. And the result is a lot of homebrew DIY mitigations. What's really evident is a lack of prior attention by security researchers. Uh, the vulnerabilities that you saw here feel like they're from the early 2000s. And we can see time and time again that embedded random number generator design remains difficult. Entropy issues mean that the design burden usually rests with system integrators and that presents a lot of troubling issues. On a positive note, QNX at least attempts to keep up with general purpose operating system security at one of the few non-Linux, BSD and Windows based embedded operating systems with any kind of exploit mitigations whatsoever. Uh, they had a quick and extensive vendor response and integration of our feedback, sometimes directly into the code. And what we really need is more attention to embedded operating system security in general. Uh, you can expect some more QNX stuff later this year at uh, Infiltrate in uh, Miami. And uh, that's it. If there's any questions, I'll take them now. Ah. Yeah. You, you mean if they had any driver support for TRNGs, stuff like that? No, I, I hadn't seen anything there, but I suspect that there are um, board support packages for particular things, maybe by BlackBerry, maybe by third party vendors, but by default, they have a very, very respect restricted space of entropy uh, sources. So I haven't seen anything there ready, like out of the box TRNG support for anything like, I don't know, what's present on some ARM cores or whatever. There's nothing like that by default. Any other questions? All right, thank you.